I thank you for the privilege to share with my family the Mishpah of God. The words that you placed in my heart for this day, of all days, Father God, to remember the living God, to remember that no grave could hold him down. Because his purpose was to obey the Father and ensure that God's word would be fulfilled. And I thank you that, Lord God, we are a part of that word. We're part of that covenant through the blood. But Lord, even I know that the shedding of the blood without the resurrection has no power. Even when Paul preached, people listened to him until he started speaking about the resurrection. But well, my brothers and sisters, without the resurrection, the gospel has no power. Amen. And we need to walk in it in the land of the living right now. Declaring that with excitement. More than just a dialogue, but an expression of, of life in every way that we have. So Father God, I ask right now, Father God, as the people are here to hear your word, that Lord God, you just do something exciting in their hearts and their spirits. Get them excited once again. And the child gets excited when they wake up in the morning and see there's a beautiful day and they can go outside and play. That's how I feel when, when I wake up in the morning and the day is there and and I have another breath in my lungs and I'm healthy. Father God, I pray that for all of us in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Would you give God all the glory? Hallelujah. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the name of the message today is called, On That Day Something Happened. On That Day Something Happened. Amen. Jesus rose up. On that day, something happened. Jesus rose up. Now, brothers and sisters, when it comes to sharing a message on a day like today, there's no new revelation. The revelation is that Jesus Christ is living. The revelation is because he lives we can face our tomorrows. Amen. Yeah. And because of that, when you embrace that, then you can hear every word that the Father puts in my mouth, every word that the Holy Spirit pours out of my heart, you will find it a new revelation. Even though it's not a new revelation, it is. Because everything that Paul said, no matter what he said when he taught and preached to the churches, no matter how many times he said it, it always became a new thing when the people forgot it. And today I find the same thing in many of our lives, especially the visual body of Christ, they've forgotten the reason why we have faith. The reason why we can have hope. Yeah. It's not because of the money you have in the bank. It's not because you're a young man or a young lady. Or that you have a rich family, you have a big house. All those things, as you know, are very perishable. Right. The thing that you must understand is he's not. Amen. He's not. Hallelujah. He's defeated sin and death and the grave. Hallelujah. Don't you understand that? And when we put him first and embrace him, then you can have that hope. That is not deferred. It's a living, breathing. Listen to what I'm going to say. It's a living, breathing hope. His name is Jesus. I've got three major readings that I'm going to give you. And one of them is going to be our foundational reading. I've asked the Lord to help me stay targeted on encouraging you today to return to your first love. Amen. Encouraging you today to be in that place of living hope. To encourage you today that you know without a shadow of a doubt that your attitude is wrapped around the fact 
that because he lives, you can and you will face your tomorrows with confidence. With confidence. And if you don't glean anything else, hang on to that. Amen. The first scripture reference I want to give you is found in Psalm 16, 5 through 11. I'll give you all three of them and we'll come back to two of them. And the last one we'll read, we'll make the, uh, the body of the message with. The first one is Psalm 16, 5 through 11. The second one is Acts chapter 2, 21 through 39. And the last reading is Luke 24, 13 through 32, which is your foundational reading. I'm going to read the first one, Psalm 16, verses 5 through 11, unless Brother Kevin has that already lined up. Do you have a mic? Yeah. Okay. I want uh, Brother Kevin to read that in the Amplified. That is Psalm 16, 5 through 11. And I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 21 through 39. And then I'm going to give you the highlights of each, each scripture reading. Brother, do you have it? Okay, Psalm 16. And the Amplified goes this way. The Lord, the Lord is my chosen and assigned portion, my cup. You hold and maintain my lot. The lines have fallen from me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given my counsel, me counsel. Yes. My heart instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord continually before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory, my inner self, rejoices. My body, too, shall rest, and confidently dwell in safety. For you will not abandon me to shield the place of the dead. Neither will you suffer your Holy One, Holy One, to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and your presence is faithfulness and joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. In the King James, it says, I will bless the Lord who had given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoice. My flesh also shall rest in hope, but thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is the fullness of joy. At the right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Why, Pastor, do you want to introduce this scripture in reference to us? Because this is David speaking about not only himself, but his Redeemer. Amen. He's talking, David spoke of that day that I'm talking about today. David spoke of that day that in verse, um, let's see, yes, in verse 10 of that reading, he says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell, hell being sure, which is the inner parts of the uh, deeper parts of the earth, or where you're buried at. Okay, that, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about hell as we understand it. He's talking about in the inner parts of the earth when you're buried, that's where you are, that's where they were at that time. In other words, he was talking about paradise. Shoal had several compartments to it. Shoal is, was beneath the earth where the Word of God says that when the, remember when the, um, the male factor that hung on the cross said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus Christ said, from this day forth, you will be with, be with me in paradise. Amen. And what was he talking about? He was talking about the fact that everybody that had died in faith or by faith prior to Christ's cross, everybody that was died, if you will, in him, waiting for the promise to come, was kept in paradise. Not in hell, but paradise. But the whole, if you will, and I did a teaching on that years ago, all the, there are different departments or compartments in or underneath the earth at that time. In paradise, that's what you remember 
Again, I'm going to take a detour, so bear with me. Remember when uh, in Luke, where Jesus recorded or spoke about the actual happening of a rich man and Lazarus dying at the same time. This was an actual happening because he named it. And he was speaking about where Lazarus, or excuse me, the rich man, entered was actually in the tormenting section. Whereas Lazarus was not. He was with Abraham in Abraham's bosom, which at that time was referred to as paradise, if you will. When Jesus Christ died, he set free the captives in paradise. And that's why you have these people rise up. They were set free. Those who died in Christ before the cross were kept in paradise. Not in hell as we understand it, okay? Now I know that some of you say, well, Pastor, I don't understand that. Well, come a little bit more often when you can and we'll talk about those things. But what's important for you to understand is paradise is and was underneath the ground. Now, when people die in Christ, their bodies remain here, but their spirit man is with the Lord at that moment. That's the difference. Why? Because the cross, because of the blood, because of what Christ did on that cross, and not only when He did that, but the Bible says that in a period of time that the curtain in the tabernacle was actually rent in two. And that was speaking about the very thing that kept God's people from going into the Holy of Holies was removed because of the blood of Christ. Now we can boldly, according to the Word of God, boldly go to the throne of mercy. Go to the throne of God and obtain all the grace and mercy we need in times of trouble. Because what was done on the cross? Amen? So when I'm looking at this verse here, it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or shore, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Who was he talking about, his Holy One? Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ did not see corruption. And Peter used that same verse in Acts chapter 2 when he was talking to the people of God. He told them, he said, David saw corruption, but Jesus did not. Go to Acts chapter 2 for me. Now, I'm not going to spend as much time as on the second slew as I did on the first one in Psalms because I want to show you something. I want you to see more than anything that God's Word is always fulfilled. Amen. Always fulfilled, no matter what we may think. Acts chapter 2, verses 21 through, to, through uh, 39, 21 through 39, is where Peter spoke concerning Jesus' resurrection on that day and the fact that David didn't. See, David wasn't resurrected. David, what I'm saying is, David's body wasn't resurrected because he saw corruption. He was when God set them free. Amen. But as far as for not seeing decay or not seeing corruption, David's body did see corruption. In other words, it decayed. Okay, but Christ didn't. And that's important to understand. Look how Peter uses that to make a point here. In chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 21, it says this. It says, And it shall come to pass, say it with me, And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Peter comes right around and says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken, he says, you people have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that it should be holden of it. For David, in this particular psalm that I gave you, David spoke about what I'm speaking about today. He is and was a prophet. He spoke the prophetic word concerning the Messiah to come and what would happen. What he says. But David speaking concerning him. Concerning whom? Jesus. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. 
for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. There's another scripture in Psalms that speaks exactly that. That he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Listen to what it says. See if it doesn't ring clear or true to what you just read in Psalms. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Did you not read that? Yes. Neither will I suffer thine holy one to what? Yes. That's exactly, he pulled that exactly from that scripture reference. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. From shall make me full of joy with thy confidence. And that's exactly what Psalm 16 was talking about. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch, David, that he is both dead and buried. That's what I was trying to say. David was dead and buried, and his scepter is with us unto this day. But watch this. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of what? The resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell and that's again sure neither his flesh did see corruption. That's powerful. You got to understand that. This Jesus had God Raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. In Luke 24, 13 through 32, we'll go to there a little bit later, which is our foundational reading. Jesus joined two of his disciples who were getting as far away from the day of crucifixion because they didn't know anything about the resurrection so they were running from that time of, of soil of hopes and excitement because you see they had been expecting Jesus to rule then and there to turn over the government then and there to make righteous judgments then and there but then all of a sudden what do they see sister Cindy they see that Jesus Christ is crucified. They see that Jesus Christ is taken down and placed in that grave. They see that a huge stone is placed in front of that grave. But that's all they see and that's all they know. So what do they do? They run. They run as far away from what happened as they can, as quick as they can. See, their hopes were dashed against the stone. Everything that they thought they understood, everything that they thought they, they could grab hold of, everything that they could believe in to have some kind of security and confidence, all of a sudden was taken from them, in a, not in a slight way, gradually, but dramatically and horrifically. In other words, they saw their dreams dead and buried. That's why I say, because he lives, we can face our tomorrows. With confidence. In other words, to them it was all over. And I'm sure they said, now what? Now what? Our hopes and our dreams are gone. What are we going to do now? Then Jesus showed up. Then Jesus showed up. He showed up on the road going out of Jerusalem. He showed up to talk with him. That's <clears throat> right. They didn't recognize him. And Jesus just flowed with them. He said, what, what are y'all talking about? Why are y'all so sad? And what are these two disciples? These were his disciples. But I want to tell you something. Even all the people that he walked with the closest when he was resurrected, they didn't recognize him. Mary didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. 
The people in the upper room said, show me your scars. Down in Thomas said, unless I stick my hand in there. Jesus showed up again and said, stick it in there. And this particular time, I chose today not to talk about those who ran to the tomb. I chose not to talk about Mary, uh, the one that uh, was delivered from so many demons that, that went to dress the Lord, her and several other ladies, went to, to prepare his body for burial. I chose not to talk about the, the tomb being emptied, the stone being removed. I chose to talk about the two disciples walking away from broken dreams, talking about feeling totally and completely confused. Why would I do that? Why not go to the old traditional rule, talk about, you know, on the first of the morning, the first day of the week, they went up early in the morning because it's been said so many times before. Even though I can't bring a new revelation because Jesus is risen, there's nothing more and greater than that. But maybe in the midst of that, we can relate to the two men walking on the road to Emos. Because you see, something happened. He showed up out of nowhere. And something happened that he hadn't done before. He witnessed of himself on that day to them by opening up scriptures to them, opening up the word to them. Somewhere in a bored tomb, something happened. Somewhere at a tomb where a huge rock that sealed an entrance was pushed aside as if it were pebbles, something happened. And that that happened would forever change the world, but it had to change his disciples first before it could change the world. They had to be able to bear witness with a first-hand knowledge that Jesus is risen. Church, I believe we as God's people need to really encourage one another more than ever so that we can stay steadfast in the things that matter. In the things that matter. We all get caught up in a lot of other things. We all get caught up, caught up in, in uh, desires and in friends and families and all that. And that's natural. But those things in themselves do not apply to your eternal salvation. That's living a life. And if you belong to the Lord, it is a blessed life, no matter what you have or don't have. Amen? Amen. When we in ourselves allow the world to define what God can do, what God can do, what God hasn't done, then where's your hope at? If the world and unfortunately many churches, Sister Cindy, have redefined God's word and limited the teaching on God's resurrection, then what is our faith built on? It cannot be built on the cross by itself. And Paul dealt with people that were in the place where there were idol worshipers more than any other place. Remember the different uh, um, heads of uh, bus that they had and all these people would worship different ones and they had one to the unknown God. And Paul went there and he was sharing the word of God and they listened because they wanted to know. But you know what turned them off? When he started speaking about the resurrection. You know what turns people off in the churches today? I mean, overall, when you start speaking about the resurrection, oh, that couldn't have happened. It's about now. Well, you say, Pastor, how can that be? Just go and talk to a few of them. Because the resurrection is not about 
a event. Amen. It's about life living. His and because his also ours. Amen. It's the promises of God in getting ourselves into a legal position because of the blood to receive the promises of God. Through obedience and faith, walked out in love. You know, the, the thing uh, that I think is one of the most important groups of scriptures that can uh, speak to you and speak to me all at the same time, individually, collectively, in your household and corporate as a church, is Psalm 23 and Psalm 91. But you've got to believe, you've got to be in a position to adhere to that. You've got, in a position, you've got to be in a position, first of all, your blood bought, redeemed child of God. But second of all, you need to be in a legal position. What does it mean by that, legal position? Well, you have to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that say, I'm born again, and, and say, hallelujah, praise God, and talk about Jesus, or talk about a God, or talk about a universe, or talk about a higher power. But let me tell you something, that's why God clearly, Designates that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then you can declare He's your shepherd and you shall not walk. If you're going to be an abider in Christ and His word is abiding in you, then you can say of the Lord, He is your refuge. But if you're not going to, that's what I'm talking about legally be there. If you're not going to abide in Him and His word is abiding in you, you can't declare that. If you're not going to follow the Lord as your shepherd, you cannot declare, I'm not, I shall not want. I don't care what you say. If you're a believer outside of, outside of the word of God, then that's not a believer. There's a lot of people that believe in a God, but not in the God. His name is Jesus. Brothers and sisters, everything that the Lord has warned us about will come to pass. Everything. But he is our hope. Even in that, for a reason. Because he's risen. In other words, our hope is alive. And because of that, the sureness of the witness, of our witness through our faith walk, needs to be a living testimony. Not a yesterday testimony, but a living testimony. Sharing with people why we have such abounding hope and joy and love, even in the midst of so much negativity, in the midst of so much hate. In the midst of so much sinfulness and so much lawlessness, is because he lives. That's why. That's why we can face our tomorrows with confidence. Isn't that what the Word of God is talking about in Hebrews eleven six, when it says that in order to please the Lord God, we must have faith, right? Isn't that what it says? The Word of God says in eleven six, it says, "But without faith, it is impossible to please. Possible to please Him." For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Brother Roger and Sister Sabrina, aren't you glad that the Lord God covers his own? Amen. Aren't you glad that your two boys are sitting next to you right now? Yes. The devil tried to take them out. Didn't he? Yes, sir. he? Couldn't touch him. You know why? And the blood. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I think it is this. Because Jesus lives, we can face all our tomorrows. Because Jesus lives, we can face all our tomorrows. And the comment that I placed here for myself was because he becomes living hope. Because he becomes living hope. And living hope that I'm talking about is Jesus risen. Jesus risen. The Word of God says in Proverbs 13, 12, right? That hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Isn't that what happened to the two guys on the road to Emos? Their hope was gone. I mean, everything they built, their hope on was gone because it was Jesus. And as far as they can remember, they had not yet heard that he was risen. 
In fact, they made a comment, and we're going to read this. They made a comment, and they told Jesus, said, now it's been three days. Where, uh, where have you been? How come you don't know about these things? Welcome, Heather, my daughter. It's important to understand that today is not about an event that came and, and is gone. <clears throat> Jesus will never go back to that grave. He will never go back to that cross. What he's done is done and it is completely and totally completed. That's why he can make intercession for you and I 24-7. That's why he does. Because we belong to him. But brothers and sisters, if all we do is keep that hope within ourselves, don't teach our children, don't teach other people but why? Not because, you know, somewhere 2,000 years plus, Jesus uh, was raised from the dead. At least that's what the Bible says. That's what we say. That's what the Bible says. That's what my faith says. What do you say? What do you say? He's alive. Well, why do you say that? Can you say that because it's a hearsay or because you know it? No. You say, I know it. You know it. You know why I know it? Because if I didn't know it, I could have no hope. I would have ended it a long time ago. And because of that, I can face my tomorrows. Do you hear me? Because of that, I can face my tomorrow. Because of that, you can face your tomorrow. The devil can't touch what he can give you. And he can give you tomorrow. God did. Amen. God did. Our text is found in Isaiah 43, verse 1, part B, through 3, part A. Isaiah 43, verse 1, part B, through 3, part A. Fear not, the very first thing. Fear not. And there's a reason why. Why you and I should fear not? Can anybody tell me why? Huh? We're redeemed. And we're redeemed not because some king has come and died. No, because the king that we serve is living. There's nothing, hear me. There's nothing on this earth, nor in heaven, nor underneath the earth, that can take him off his throne. There's nothing. No matter what the world says, no matter what the government says, no matter what the devil says, I am redeemed, you are redeemed, so he is our hope alive and because he's alive. He is risen. You and I can not only face our tomorrows, but face them with confidence. With confidence. You see, when I say with confidence, Expecting the plan of God to be carried out in your life. And if the plan of God is carried, in, carried out in your life, it doesn't matter what your plans are. Because His plan is greater than your plan. The Word of God says, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine when thou passest through the waters. I will be with thee. Not I might be with thee. Not I'll think about it. But I will. I mean, that's about, that's a, <laughs> I will. It don't matter when that comes, it doesn't matter when the waters come upon you. It doesn't matter how many generations are removed from that statement. That I will is a present tense word that carries past generations, carries past ages. It comes to the fact that no matter when, no matter where, no matter how, He will be with you. But are we with Him? When thou pass through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. He didn't tell you that you wouldn't pass through the waters. He says, when you pass through the waters. He didn't tell you you wouldn't go through the, into the rivers. He said, but those rivers that you go in, they will not overflow you. When thou walkest the fire, he did not say that you wouldn't be, have your feet put to the gridiron. He didn't say there wouldn't be challenges beyond anything that, that you couldn't even catch your breath. He says, no matter what, he says, 
they will not kindle upon thee. In other words, they will not find a place on you to do any damage. Why? For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Church, as the Holy Spirit leads me today, let's just embrace the Word of God that Jesus is and has and will always remain risen, in other words, living. Let's always embrace that we as believers and followers of Jesus Christ can face our tomorrows no matter what the challenge is. Because he is alive. He can stand over his word to perform it because he's alive. He's not a mere man. He is God. And the Bible says in Proverbs 18.10, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth into it, and they are safe. Church, as I said, the four gospels of the Lord that we can read in our New Testament. They all have an account of that day. Every last one of them have an account of that day concerning Christ's resurrection day. And they may all vary a little in some detail. And they do. But what they don't vary on is this. On the third day, Jesus arose. Yeah. And on that day, that stone that was before the mouth of that tomb of that cave was rolled away. And they don't vary on this, that Jesus was not amongst the dead. They don't said that. Because in fact, they all say, and they don't vary with this either, that he has risen. And better yet, they say he is risen. All of his burial clothes all bear witness to that, even in the way they had fallen off of his body. In other words, he rose while those clothes were on him and they just fell off of him. But yet he took the burial cloth from his face and put it separate. He folded that, the rest was in, in, in a rubble. The burial cloth couldn't contain him. It reminds me, I remember when Jesus Christ went to Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Remember? He, was, he had died. And, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later if I have a chance. But remember, Martha was the first one that said, Lord, if you'd have been here, he would not have died. And then the, the Lord God made a comment to her. He said, don't, Martha, don't you believe that, that, that I am the resurrection and life? He said, but Lord God, I know that when, when the time comes that everybody will be raised up. And she never answered that question because she didn't believe. She believed at the end of time, but when he was saying it's not an event that needed to happen, he says, I am the event. I am the resurrection and life, is what he told her. And you know what she says? This is Martha, uh, Mary's coming. She, she needs to talk to you. Sometimes the Lord God puts his finger on our heart and he says, Do you believe this particular thing? And we answer, we answer him, but in so many roundabout answers that, that we, we find ourselves going around in circles and yet we have not answered what we need to answer for ourselves. Do you believe he can, what he was saying, he says, I am all in all. There's nothing greater than I am. Death is not greater than Jesus. He conquered it. We, when we were created, we were not meant to die. We were not meant to get old until, until Adam and Eve fell short. Until they decided to be able to be like God. They wanted to be able to decide for themselves what was good and evil when God already showed them what was good and evil. We also see again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, go there for me, 1 through 11, and then 20 through 24. I, I said this the other night, Wednesday night, and a lot of people don't understand the impact that, that Paul was making. And again, you notice he wasn't speaking to the world, he was speaking to the church. 
I find it amazing that I find myself in the same um, position of understanding exactly what Paul was talking about. It's not that the people of God had not heard what he was saying, but they had lost the emphasis of what he was saying. They had lost the importance of the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he was saying to them. Look what he said in, in verses 1 through um, 11. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Look what he says. Look, look how he lays it out, the gospel. Very simple. He says, By which also you are, what? Saved. Saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, was he talking about the cross? No. He was talking about the resurrection. Let me explain that to you before anybody starts throwing the stone. The cross is an altar, but the cross in itself, to be understood perfectly and to be preached rightly, you must preach the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. Passover, unleavened bread, and sheep of the first fruits. First fruit. That's the three. Passover, unleavened bread. They all make up the same season, but each one of them have a particular part to play in our lives. We are justified when we believe in Christ and the fact that he was able to take our sins upon himself and die for our sinfulness. That's called justification. But what we are in right now is what is called the journey or the unleavened bread of life, which is sanctification. Which is being in Christ, being buried with Christ. And that's perfectly understood as my wife uh, grasped and loves to declare early in the morning at Galatians 2.20. Remember, you made a song about that. It's not I that live, but he that liveth in me. But anyway, look what it says here. He says, For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Can I hear an amen? amen. But is, is that the bottom line? Is that it? No, because you see, if he died for our sins, but he was not raised up, then he didn't die for our sins, and we have no hope. See, he had to be raised up, so therefore the resurrection is the nail, so to speak, that fashions everything together. Because if the resurrection is not real, then nothing else is. Right. If the resurrection is not real, then Jesus Christ was, was nothing more than a good teacher, another just man that was killed without right, without cause. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to understand that. There were three men at home that day. Jesus Christ in the middle. He was the only innocent one. One was forgiven of his sins because he realized who Jesus was. The other one said, if you are who you say you are, take us and you off of the cross. That's why Jesus Christ says, you must deny yourself first and then take up your cross. When you find a person that is religious, what they're trying to do is take up the cross before denying themselves. You can't do it. In other words, you put Christ first. That's what it means when you say deny yourself. Anyway, read with me. In verse 4, and that he was buried and that he arose again sometime there in the week. No, again, there's no variation in that. The third day, according to the scriptures. Now listen. And that he was seen of, of Cephas, whom is who? Peter. Then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once. Well, where did they come from? I told you all earlier. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me. Wow. You see, you understand what he's saying? Right after resurrection, Jesus Christ made himself known to several people, but it's a while before he made himself known to Paul. That's why I'm talking about Paul didn't, you gotta understand, Paul didn't read about this. 
These people didn't read about this. We're reading about it. Paul didn't read about what happened to, to Jesus. He didn't read about what happened uh, through uh, Peter and them. No. Jesus met him and preached the same gospel to him. And you're going to see where he did the same thing to the two men on the road of Emmaus. Yes, sisters, they didn't recognize him. But the reason why they didn't recognize him is because they didn't really understand the depth of the scriptures that he'd been telling them. They didn't understand what he had truly come here to do. Like so many people today, they have no idea what was done on the cross, what was done in the grave, and what was done on the day of resurrection. And many of them don't even care about it, even though they claim to be believers. And how can you be a believer if you cannot know and believe personally that Jesus Christ was not only uh, crucified for our sinfulness and buried for that, but raised up on the third day? Because if you can't believe in the last, the rest is of no value to you. You're still dead in your sins. And I'm still dead in my sins. And if I had to believe that, I would not be here with you today. I'd be, I'd be dead. Because I would not want to go on living without the knowledge that Christ has a plan for me. And it's not just for being here. It's for eternity. Amen. And that's what the Word of God is saying. Let me read it before I get too carried away here. It says, and that he was seen of Cephas, the then of the twelve, and that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James. Now, who's James? That's right, his brother. Whose brother? Jesus' brother. Really? Yes, really. James, then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Boy, I can understand that. Because we were all born out of due time. We all recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At least I pray that you all do. Because without it, you're just spinning your wheels. It says here, For I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But... By the grace of God, I am what I am. And you know, a lot of people say, well, I am what I am because I'm, you know, I'm just me. Well, brothers and sisters, if that's the way you feel, you need to rearrange your attitude. Because the only reason why you are allowed to be here is by the grace of God. But not to be who you want to be. Be who God wants you to be. Look what he says here. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was what? With me. I want you to go, if you will. Well, no, let's just continue a little bit. Therefore, whether it be, it were I or they, so we preach it, so you believe. Now, if Christ be preached that he arose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, if you will, I want you to jump down to 20. This is where the, the point that I'm trying to make with all of you today is. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Are you with me? And become, what did I tell you? He became the first, what? Fruits of them that is left. According to the feast of the Lord, Passover. Remember what I told you? Passover is crucifixion, unleavened bread, and first fruit. And that's what he's talking about. But for you to understand first fruits that he's talking about, you have to understand that Jesus, when he stood up, when he was resurrected, he came before the Father as an offering and said, Lord, Father, this is what your harvest will look like. Like me. And the Word of God says that in 1 John chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, 1 through 3. He says, we don't know what we shall be like or what we should look like, but we shall be like Him. Amen. So this is what we're talking about. Listen. First fruits of them that slept. Jesus was not just the first fruits, but He was known as the sheaf of the first fruit. The head of the first fruit. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. How did, it, how did death come by man? Adam. 
Death came by Adam, right? So, how did Adam, how did life come by one man? Jesus. It is known, it is actually said that Jesus is the second Adam. The word of God says, for as an Adam all died. In other words, when we were born out of our mother's womb, from the flesh, from a baby, we were born with what a lot of religions call the original sin. We were all born with that. And no matter how old or how young you are, we were all born. He said, well, they didn't know how to, they didn't, a baby doesn't know how to sit. No, they don't. But that's why grace is there. Because they're protected. And I'm so grateful for that. The word of God says here, for as Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Are y'all still with me? Listen. But every man in his own order, Christ the first truth, afterward, they that are Christ and his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority. Go back, if you will, with me to um, verse 14. Uh, I said 13 and then 14. Remember it said 13 where we ended. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And in verse 14 it says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. <clears throat> Go to Hebrews chapter... Let's see. 4 verse 2. And this is important for us to understand. See, not everybody that's hearing my voice or hearing somebody preach the Word of God, the genuine Word of God that is written is referred to as the full gospel, the full counsel of God. Look, it says in verse 2 of Hebrews, For unto us was the gospel preached. Is the gospel being preached to you today? Yes. Okay. As well as unto them, as well as to others. And you can understand what he's talking about if you read verse 1 as well in Hebrews chapter 4. But he said, the word preached did not profit them. Why, sister? Why didn't it profit them? Because it tells you in the very next part, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And that's what he was talking about in 1 Corinthians. If we do not preach resurrection, then it will not profit anyone, no matter what they hear or don't hear. The only way that I know that true, genuine faith comes and grows and bears fruit is what the Word of God says. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if it's no longer preached as being real, as being a reality, but only kind of preached as a, what I call a, a uh, multiple choice thing. You know, multiple choice. Hey, listen, you can believe that all your sins are forgiven, but you don't have to live a new life. There's no newness of life. There's no nothing. But the newness of life is resurrection. Amen. Go with me to um, Romans 6. Romans 6, verses 1 through 5. The Word of God says, For what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now we're talking about willing sin. We're not to, we know that we're going to sin until the Lord takes us home. But you know, you don't have to be in wanting sin. You don't have to know something is wrong and say, well, you know, by grace I can sin. No, by grace you can't sin. That's why, by grace, you don't have to sin. You can get all the help you need. Well, Pastor, what about my thoughts? You can tell me about it. We need all the help we can get there. Because our thoughts are what, what's instrumental that your hands don't work, your feet don't work, your mouth don't work without you thinking what you're thinking before you're doing what you're doing. Amen. Word of God says here, look, it says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, that means be crucified with Christ, live any longer therein. 
Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his what? Death. Therefore, verse 4, we are buried. Here you go. We are buried with him by baptism into what? Into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank you, Lord. And it goes on one more verse, Alanya. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So Paul was constantly reaffirming this truth. Whatever he went and preached, because he knew that if the resurrection was not preached and believed, then we have nothing to place our hope in. And that's the truth. It'd be just like any other religion that has good things in it. And there are many other religions that have good things in them. But there's only one relationship that boasts about a risen God, a risen Savior. There's only one. There's not any other religion, no matter how good, because all the other religions depend on good men doing good things. But our faith is dependent upon what Jesus did and the fact that what he did was put sin and death in the grave underneath his feet. No man, no matter what kind of religion, you say, well, all religions are good. But not all of them will bring you to a relationship and to eternity. There are many other religions that people do good things. They treat people right. They are courteous, respectful. But if Jesus Christ is not at the core of your faith, then your religion, your relationship is in vain because there's no living hope. You can't face your tomorrows unless Jesus is in your tomorrow. Anybody hear me today? Amen. Church, if possible, just as we come to that place where we're going to start leveling off real quick. I want us to remember I told you our foundational reading would be found in Luke chapter 24 verses 13 through 32. I won't go through every verse, but I will highlight as we go through certain points that I want you to, to kind of think about. So if possible with me today as I've lined this up by the direction of the Holy Spirit, I want us to kind of eavesdrop on that road of Emos, on their conversation, by putting ourselves in their positions for a moment. Just stop and think about it. You're one of the two travelers. You've been following Jesus Christ. You see all this happen. And you get as far away from that, that destruction, as far away as what you saw happen, happen because you're fearful. That's the bottom line. You're fearful. Because if Jesus could be put on a cross and, and slain like that, horrifically, what more could they do to you? So, Brother Clive, they were walking. It's like you and I would be walking on the road. Man, did you see what happened to Jesus? Man, I can't believe that. Well, Brother Clyde, what do you think? I don't, I don't know. That's not what Jesus told us. I mean, that's not what he said. Pastor, didn't he say that? Well, I don't know, Clyde. I, I was with you. I mean, I heard the same thing you heard. Oh, no, brother, we can't read the Bible because the Bible wasn't written yet. Oh, no. It, hey, man, listen, we, we were there. The problem is, you see, we would be doing the same thing they were. And the greater problem is, we've got all these witnesses telling us exactly what happened, and yet it's hard for us to wrap our whole lives around. Yet we can read it. They couldn't read it, Sister Sidney. They had to live it. I mean, they were talking, okay, let me take, I'm, I'm not being a uh, uh, male chauvinist here. Okay, 
Me and Sister Nell and Heather were walking down the road to Emos. Oh, he, Heather, did you see what happened? Well, no, Daddy. I didn't see what happened. Well, now, did you see what happened? Well, I, I heard about what happened. I mean, they took Jesus. You remember what Jesus said? Well, no, I don't quite remember all that he said. That's the kind of conversation we'd be having. All of us. I don't care who you think you are. We would all be having something similar to that. And then, lo and behold, Jesus pops up. And when Jesus pops up, he just... He gets me sometimes when I read the book. He just, you know, he just, <laughs> he walks up and he's like, he puts his hand on the shoulder and he says, what you guys talking about? And they look at him, what's the matter with you, man? Where you been? And they would say, where you been? Didn't you know what happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, tell me. He wanted to get their take on what they saw happen. He already knew what had happened. Because <laughs> he was the center of the cross. He was the center of the grave. And he was the center of the resurrection. He was all in all. So he already, brother, he already knew what happened. But he wanted to see and hear what they saw and what they thought happened. Why? So that he could fill them in on what happened but needed to happen so something greater could happen. Jesus opened that conversation for them so that it could be no longer hearsay witnesses but real time witnesses to the fact Jesus was alive. He had to tell them, he had to ask them, what are you talking about? Well, let's just take a moment and after we come off that road to Emos, let's just stop and think about in today's world with all the distractions, with all the things that we read in the Word of God that we think are supposed to happen and they didn't turn out the way that we thought they were going to happen. We didn't see them happening the way that we understood the Word to be that we brought about these things that happened. We too probably would be looking for a place to run to. Regardless of where I'm not listening, that's all of us. Unless we understood the Word of God. Jesus didn't yell at them, but he asked them, why are you so sad? Because you see, the whole time that he walked with them, just like our faith right now, Brother Kevin, the whole time that we share the word of God with one another, it's for a reason. It's not because of a dead faith. It's for a living hope. When we come together, and that's what the life of me, I don't understand why people don't want to come together more often so that we can be encouraged more often about the word of God that's alive. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. Because you see, no matter who you are, sometimes we just start to, to think that it, uh, it's a, an automatic thing to think that, you know, because Jesus, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is part of our faith, that it is more of a hearsay thing than a personal thing. You see, if they had not been told, and even if they, and to be honest with you, they had been told. Jesus told all of them that on the third day he would be raised up. He told every last one of them. But they did not understand. Jesus is telling us many things right now from the word of God. But we just do not understand. We want to put our own spin to things. But get excited. If he met those two men on the road to, to Emos. He'll meet you wherever you are too and explain things to you. He'll open up the Word of God. He won't go around the Word of God. He'll go right to the Word of God to where you say, Lord, I've been hearing that for so I just never saw it that way. He says, because you were looking at it in your physical eyes and not your spiritual eyes. Amen. Church today, when I look around us, I see so many people in the world and I understand they don't believe in Christ. And even if they do believe in Christ, it's, a, it's an image of their own minds. It's not the Christ of the Bible. 
And they definitely don't believe in the resurrection because their hope and security is in a man or some government or whatever platforms or programs they have. But when believers' actions start to align themselves up with the world, it's through fear. It's because they have not walked or are walking in the faith that's focused on Jesus risen. Because you see, they don't believe in the resurrection and that just floors me. I know many believers that that's, that's the last thing they talk about is resurrection. But what you've got to understand, what they are forgetting to understand is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is living and was raised up, he is now able to come back for his bride. He's coming back. If you can't believe in his resurrection, if you don't focus on his resurrection, you won't focus on being prepared for his coming. You think those two men on Emos were expecting Jesus to show up? So much so that they didn't recognize him? It says that their eyes were holding. In other words, their eyes were, were not focused. They were not able to, to see who he was. It, I mean, he hadn't changed. He was still the same. But they didn't recognize him. You know why? Because they were looking and remembering in the flesh more so than hearing the word in the spirit. How do I know that? Because they all thought that what Jesus was talking about was overturning the government in the flesh while he was there. So their minds were seeing things and understanding things according to their understanding and not God's word. Much like today's church, what's left of it. But I want you to know there's a remnant rising up somewhere, somehow. There's ones and twos, there's groups like us, there's houses, there's, there's intercessors, there's people, there's, there's young people, young teenagers. Somewhere, somehow, something is happening. A revival flame is bursting forth. Something is happening. And don't be discouraged. Something is happening because Jesus lives. Amen. Jesus lives. And believe me, you're going to need that confidence. But there's no better place to have confidence than he who has defeated the enemy. He has defeated everything. His feet are on top of the neck of Satan. His feet. Now he says, put your feet on mine. And together we'll hold his head where it belongs. Underneath the hill. Amen. Anybody receiving anything? Amen. Let's bring it to a point so you can... Have the rest of your day to do what you will. Church, in today's times, I see something that grieves me more than anything else. I see hopelessness, Sister Cindy Lou, in the churches. I see hopelessness in the world. I see hopelessness in our communities. I see hopelessness in our young people. I see hopelessness in our educational system, whatever's left of that. I see hopelessness in the hospitals. I see hopelessness in the jail cells. Hopelessness is like a cancer, a devouring cancer that is targeting all good, healthy cells. And we can't allow it to continue. We've got to put a stop to it. We've got to stand together and we've got to say no to that that needs to be said no to. And we've got to look to Jesus who says, look unto me and I will give you all you need. I am your living hope. I will give you the confidence. Fear not. Fear not, for I am with thee wherever thou so ever goes. When the, when the river flows up, when the waters rise, when the fire gets hot, he says, fear not. I won't let it touch you. It'll come against you, but it will not touch you. Not have his way with you. You know why? Because he's a living, risen Savior. And all the things that you and I want more than anything else is just safety and security comes when we declare that he is Jehovah, Rohi, our shepherd. When he is Jehovah Nisi, our banner. When he is our miracle. When he is our refuge. Those are all things. And what makes it even more powerful now is the fact that because he lives, we can face our tomorrows. Brothers and sisters, what concerns me more than anything else is I see so much hopelessness in our families. And like I said, in our churches and in this world. But the thing that should never happen is that same hopelessness should never be reflected in the lives of believers. 
what should be reflected in our lives is hope. Is a hope because you see when hope is no longer who we are, then we can't be a tree, a living tree. We can't be a tree. Well, it is a living tree, right? You can't hope defer it, make it the heart sick. But when it becomes, when you realize it, when you receive it, what happens? A living tree, no, a tree of life. You become a tree of life. Listen, people always go towards someone who has hope, genuine hope. That's why Peter said, always have an answer to give everyone that asks you why you have hope. If you tell them, well, you know, I'm, I'm in great health. Uh, I have a whole lot of money. I have a great husband, a great wife, a great family. I got a great education. That doesn't help them. That doesn't help them. You know what helps them? When you tell them my hope is in Jesus Christ, the living risen Savior, because that is not referred to how much they have, but who they have. Church, I'm coming to a close because it's important that you think about the hope that you have and why. I hope to encourage all of us to stay the course and fight the good fight of faith and to endure to the end and stay excited enough to share the reality of Christ alive, resurrected, of Jesus Christ and that he's real. And I don't mean with just a sing song philosophy. I'm talking about what Christ did with his two men to Emos. He shared his faith to remind them about their faith. His story opened their eyes. His testimony opened their eyes. Don't you understand why I chose it now? What he shared with them was not hearsay, it was him say. He was and is the testimony. He is, and that's what he opened up the scriptures to. He opened up the scriptures about himself to them, and all of a sudden, it says when they broke bread, they looked at him, and their eyes were open. Because the testimony that he shared was his. What makes the difference in other people that you're sharing with is when the testimony you share is not hearsay, it's yours. And that's all I'm saying on this day of all days. Let's open up the word of hope today from the promised word of God through our own lives. And let's get excited to share that hope with all that ask why we have such hope. Sometimes believers get too far removed from the reality of their faith by neglecting the word of God that produces hope in them. Whether it be because of time or distractions, complacency or compromise. And yes, wanton, ongoing sin or even well-intended traditions that end up minimizing the power of our risen Savior that we celebrate through our worldly celebrations. See, there must always be order. Christ first, Christ first, Christ first. That's the order. Church, we need to be, need to be reminded it's not just an event that happened, especially Resurrection Day, but what happened in this event. Jesus Christ is the event. It is the risen Savior that came forth in that event. Jesus Christ rose up, and that's what happened. And we celebrate Him because of what it means for us, not Him. He rose for us. John eleven twenty five 25 says that Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And what's the thing that people don't attach to? That hope, that living hope that enables you to face tomorrow is what is found in the end. What Jesus Christ well said in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. He was speaking to John. And John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. Again. Fear not. I am, listen closely. I am the first and the last. 
I am he that liveth and was dead. Again, he bears testimony of the word, because the word is him. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And he says, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall come hereafter. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says in Romans 8, 11 through and verses 14 through 17, it says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He says, therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and that the children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified with him. Brothers and sisters, I'll close with this. The importance of what we celebrate and why is because he is risen. And because he is risen, and I'm not talking for the world here, I'm talking about for true believers. See, the world can't receive this unless they come first to the cross. But those of us who have come to the cross can't walk in this unless we get past the cross and live unto him so that we can live in the newness of life. You can't constantly go back to the principal things. You and. <laughs> There are far too many people that think that because, because you were baptized as a child that you're going to heaven. No. That you were baptized as an adult that you're going to heaven. No. It's when you are a follower of Jesus Christ. These things, being baptized as an adult, is a byproduct of genuine salvation. The true baptism is in the heart. There are many people that are looking that they have no idea what baptism is. And I read to you what baptism is in concern to knowing the resurrection, the power of God. It's found in Romans 6, 1 through 4. Did we talk about it? It says that if we're to be crucified with Christ, we're buried with Christ. And being buried with Christ means that we are to walk in the newness of life. That's why I keep saying, because he lives, we can face our tomorrows. This is why our hope, Sister Flo, is not deferred. Because if we truly believe, he becomes that tree of life. And we become a people of expectation. We expect God to show up when we need him the most. See, we are not waiting, hear me well, we are not waiting for a Savior to come. We're not. He has already come. We are waiting for something else. He's already come and saved us. He's alive and waiting to return for us to come back. That's why John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again. I will come again, Brother Mike. It's not maybe, he will come again. And like I said, if you are not here when he comes again, it's because you went to meet him, so you still need to be ready. Amen. For us to believe, for us who believe this message is of no great revelation. But much of the time, even though we believe, we need the Lord to help us in our unbelief. Because the world and its distractions have a way of wearing us down. But not out. They're wearing us down. And that's what 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9 means and says. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Brothers and sisters, as I close today, let me ask you something. Can you face your tomorrows? Why can you face your tomorrows? Because he lives. You can face your tomorrows. You know, there is no later time in trusting God. Such as when we feel everything's right. And we feel things are easier for us to trust him. Well, the Bible does say our times are in his hands, not ours. They're in his hands. Now, brothers and sisters, as I close, let me just share the hope that is alive. The Bible says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal man must put on immortality. So when this corruptible, corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to the past the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That song I told you all about goes like this. It said, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love and to heal and to forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. Because he lives, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Church, I still believe in that. With all my heart. So fear not. Encourage one another with God's unfailing love and truth. No matter what comes our way in the days, the weeks, or the years. Because he lives, we can't face our tomorrows. Father God, I thank you, Lord. That your word, I believe in faith, it fallen to ears today. I pray that it prick to your hearts by the leading of the Holy Spirit. That everything that you need is found in Christ, in Christ risen. Period. You can't change your yesterdays, but he can remove the consequences of your yesterdays. You can't change your future, but he has your future plan for you. And all he wants is for you to walk with him. When you walk with him, he walks with you. And you can always say, because of that, you can always, always know that your future is in good hands. You know why, Sister Sidney? Because he lives. We can face our tomorrows. Moses told the people, he blessed them and he told them that they needed to trust God. Joshua blessed the people and told them that they needed to trust God. I'm telling you that your tomorrows you don't need to be fearful of it, no matter what the government does, no matter what the one world order system may be, no matter what. You see, I still believe the goodness in the land of the living because he who lives holds my tomorrow and I can face every one of them. With that, let me bless you as Moses blessed his people. 
The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. You can't ask for anything more than that. I pray that as you go your way this evening, this afternoon, or whatever celebration you have on, that you have some remembrance of what we talked about today. And that it can't help but just flow out of you with excitement. I pray that no matter where you go today, and no matter what challenges you find yourself facing today or tomorrow, rejoice and know that because he lives, you can face tomorrow with confidence. Father God, I ask that you bless each and every person here. I, bless, I ask that you bless them traveling wherever they need to go. But most importantly, Father God, I pray and I, I ask, Lord, that everyone here lift you up and give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. give God all the glory. Amen.